I now have the great pleasure, for the second year in a row, of introducing uh, my, you heard this last year, but Princeton rules demand us to say this, uh, my 1980 classmate, uh, General Mark Milley, who is the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. Uh, he, he assumed duty as the 39th Chief of Staff of the Army in 2015. Uh, he has had a remarkable career, and I'm not going to go through it except to just point out a few things that I think bear directly on the future of war. He has served in command positions uh, at bases in North Carolina, California, New York, Korea, Hawaii, Kentucky, and Iraq. So just think about that and wonder how many, how, how likely that will be 10 to 20 to 30 years from now in terms of the career of a, uh, the top uh, officer in the Army. And he has been deployed to, to Sinai in Egypt, uh, to um, Panama, uh, to Haiti, to Bosnia-Herzegovina, to Iraq, to Afghanistan, to Somalia, and Colombia. So ask yourself also, if in the future, what that means about where our forces have been deployed and where they will be deployed. Please uh, welcome General Milley. Thank you. <laughs> it looks so great. All right. Come have a seat here. So I get to sit on the couch. Awesome. <laughs> get people in the, the right reflective mood. That's right. That's right. That's right. So, General Milley, in first place, um, we are thrilled to have you back because we heard you last year. Uh, and I, wanna, I want to start our conversation taking off from where we were last year, where you said you thought that in 10 to 20 years, there would be a change, in, not in the nature of war, but the character of war. So my first question is explain that difference and then I want to, want to take off from there. Um, well, the nature of war, I think, is immutable. Uh, it has to do with politics. War is about uh, imposing your will, your political will, on your opponent by the use of organized violence. Uh, and that's the essential part of war. That's what distinguishes it from diplomacy. Um, and the nature of war is characterized by, you know, friction, fog, uh, politics, human will, those sorts of uh, factors. And I don't think that's going to change. That's been around for several thousands of years. Um, that's probably not going to change. But the character of war changes and, and changes uh, from time to time frequently. Uh, but fundamentally, it only changes once in a while in a fundamental sense. And I think we're on the cusp of a fundamental change in the character of war. And the character of war has to do um, with a lot of things. Uh, uh, technology is oftentimes one of the drivers of the change in uh, character of war, but also the social factors, how you organize a, a political system, such as uh, following the French Revolution as an example, when Napoleon had a nation in arms, that was a, a fundamental shift in the character of war. And because it differed from the way armies had been organized in the past? Right. From monarchy-type armies, you now had a nation uh, committed to an idea, uh, France, uh, and he was able to mobilize uh, the mass of his, of his greatest asset, which was, which was his people. Uh, whereas the monarchy, uh, would, you know, previous monarchies could only uh, mobilize so many professional soldiers that they were willing to pay for. Um, so that shift <clears throat> meant that Napoleon had a different type of army. Uh, in its people, based on a social or political change. Right. Uh, other changes that have occurred, you know, a lot of them are technology. So, uh, you know, the introduction of the stirrup, when people learned how to steer a horse or the, or the bit. <laughs> thought about the stirrup. <laughs> uh, or, or the change from a, a musket, a smoothbore right. musket, uh, to a rifled uh, weapon, which increased the lethality and the range of the weapon. The introduction of machine gun, airplane, mechanization, those sorts of things fundamentally change the character. Uh, but if you look at, uh, for example, one of the most discussed changes in the character of war was uh, mechanization, uh, wheels and tracked vehicles, in combination with uh, aircraft and in combination with the radio, which allowed right. for dispersed command and control. Uh, all those technologies were available to all the countries of the 1920s and 30s. So the United States, the Soviet Union, Britain, France, Germany, they all had those. Uh, but what, <clears throat> the only country that really combined them in a unique way of war, which was doctrine, 
uh, with the Germans, and that allowed them then to overrun Europe between 1939 and 1942. With the Blitzkrieg. With which we call the Blitzkrieg, which is really a Western term. The Germans call it a war of movement. But, uh, but the, uh, they were able to take the uh, technologies and combine them in a unique way of war. Uh, so that changed the character of war uh, in at the mid-20th century. So uh, you've got different periods of time in which character of war has changed. Uh, but the nature of war has remained pretty immutable. Over okay, time. so if the character of war can change as a result of social and political upheaval, technology, how you put technology together with doctrine, what is it today that you see that is fundamentally changing the character of war? Oh, uh, there's a lot of factors, I think, that are converging in time and space. Uh, I think, in terms of time, my guess is that the character of war, the fundamental shift in the character of ground, ground war in particular, uh, will change, my guess is, about 10 years from now. That's why I say we're on the cusp of it. We're not in it yet, but we can see the previews. Uh, and and uh, in terms of time, you've probably got about 10 years, maybe 15 at the outside. Um, and what's changing, uh, you know, there's some societal things changing. Right. So uh, if you look at demographics, uh, one of the big phenomena that's occurred over, say, 100, 150 years is the urbanization of the world's uh, population. Uh, that's uh, really, the rise over run has significantly increased uh, so today, uh, I think you might have something like 10 megacities or 12 megacities or yep. something like that defined as over 10 million people. Uh, but by mid-century, we're going to have at least 50 or more megacities. And like 30 will be in China alone when you look at the, yeah, I mean, the size. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So, uh, and if war is really about politics, and the root word of politics is polis, the Greek polis, so it's about uh, people and power. Uh, so if war is about politics, it's going to be fought in general where people are. Uh, and it'll be fought, uh, in my opinion, in urban areas. So we are probably seeing a shift, a fundamental shift in the physical terrain right. of where wars will be fought from rural or desert type areas, uh, sparsely populated areas, to heavily densely populated areas. Uh, in megacities. So that means something like uh, looking at uh, the Fallujah or the Syrian cities, that's not sort of an anomaly. That is where you think war will be fought. When we look right. at these, these horrific pictures right. of Aleppo, that's... Yeah, I think and Aleppo, uh, Fallujah, uh, Mosul, uh, in my view, uh, these are previews uh, of future war on a larger scale, perhaps. Um, so, like before World War I. World War I, uh, it's long been written that the generals couldn't connect the dots of the technologies, the machine gun, the barbed wire, uh, and some other to the, the uh, artillery, the massive artillery, and it led to a huge slaughter. Uh, and the ascent of the defense over the offense. So they entered World War I thinking that cavalry chargers and close order drill going across open fields was a good tactic. Uh, and then they ran into the machine gun and so on and led to a mass slaughter and eventually trench lines and so on and so forth. Well, the previews of World War I were already seen in the, in the Boer War, the Russia-Japanese War, the American Civil War, the Franco-Prussian War, and several other wars that occurred uh, prior to World War I. But people didn't quite connect the technology with the doctrine, with the terrain, and so on and so forth, uh, and led to the result we got in World War I. So as we move forward, the challenge for not just the Army, but uh, you know, Navy, Air Force, Marines, all of us, uh, and I would argue all armies around the world are looking at pretty much the same thing, is how do you take these technologies that are out there, apply them to your ways of war, your doctrine, right. uh, and then apply them to some of the social changes that we're seeing. So what does all that mean then? So, like for the Army as an example, if in fact uh, future war will be largely fought in urban terrain, What's the so what? Well, that has huge implications for the United States Army. Uh, the United States Army has been optimized for 241 years uh, to fight in uh, rolling terrain, gently rolling hills, northern hemisphere. We were sub-optimized for jungle war. We have the capability for jungle war, but we're not optimized for it. Uh, we're sub-optimized for mountain warfare capability, but not optimized. We do deserts, but not We do mountains. deserts. Yep. We do deserts, but 
uh, and was suboptimized for urban capabilities, right? So what this means then, and, and I've discussed this with the Army leadership, is we're going to have to, as we move forward, uh, within the next 10 years, optimize the Army uh, for uh, urban warfare. Uh, and that, that's a general statement. That has all kinds of doctrinal implications. How do you fight in an urban area? Equipment implications uh, for the, the width, size, weight of tanks or, or tractor wheel vehicles, the elevation of guns, uh, the wingspan of helicopters or the, the rotor span of helicopters. Uh, and there's a thousand other implications. And how are you, I mean, so, so you've also, uh, when you think about the changes over history from, you know, large massed formations, I'm just thinking about the Revolutionary War, right? You have the British in these large mass formations, you have the Americans, you know, not in uniform, able to be much scrappier. What does that mean for urban warfare in terms of how the, the army's got to be organized and what kinds of weapons it faces? Well, the, for the organization part, that'll be a significant change. If we optimize for uh, urban combat, uh, by the nature, urban areas compartment uh, organizations, just by streets and buildings and floors and rooms and so on and so forth. Uh, so the Army will defin definitely have to organize differently, uh, probably into smaller, more compartmented groups uh, that can operate in a network. You, you know, your recent book there, well, I guess it's published today or something like that. Uh, you had an advanced copy. I had an copy. advanced copy. <laughs> uh, but, but she's right on, on the networked nature of the future. So we'll have to have uh, what I think is a lot of relatively small formations that are networked uh, and can leverage, uh, you know, Air Force or Naval delivered uh, joint fires uh, and leverage other units within the area to achieve a battlefield effect. When you say uh, relatively small, how many people? Well, that's that's where we're, we're debating that. You know how big uh, uh, organize. You know these are units of action sort right. of thing. Um, probably somewhere in the range of companies to battalions, something like that. Uh, now that doesn't mean you you do away with battalions and brigades and divisions. That's not at all what it's, it's saying. The operational unit we're talking about. Not yeah, the operational, the fighting element will probably end up having to be a much smaller entity. Uh, if you think uh, in some ways, you think of how some of our special operations operate today. Right. That may be a preview of how larger armies operate in the future. And the, when, when you and I also uh, spoke before, you, you pointed out that with GPS and cell phones, there is no element of surprise in the same way, which also seems to me to be a, a major uh, change in how you have to think about, I mean, when I think about general plotting strategy, I think, you know, obviously uh, where I go in the summer is where Hannibal defeated the Romans in the Second Punic War, and he did it because the Romans marched around the mountain into the rising sun, and the Carthaginians were deployed on the, in the hills exactly where we go, and they, and they had the element of surprise, and they drowned a lot of people in the lake. Had people had cell phones, you know, right. that would have been a right. little harder to do. Yeah, so uh, you know, one of the additional technological changes that we're seeing and, and have been seeing really for 20 years or so uh, is sort of the ubiquitous nature of information technologies. And with that comes sensors. So all of these iPhones, for example, that are out there uh, are communication devices, right. but they're also sensors uh, in the sense that you can video, you can tape record, you can track them. Uh, so, in, in a very real way, almost nowhere on Earth can you be unobserved. Uh, oh, and that's a huge so for, change. That's, a, that's yeah. the first time, really, in human history. Uh, and that's not an absolute. That's not like you, you can't, abs you know, it's not a total absolute. But uh, it's the ability to see uh, worldwide uh, is fundamentally different than anything previously seen in human history. So if you can be seen uh, with the advent of precision munitions, you can be hit. Uh, so large formations running around on a battlefield uh, will be dead formations uh, because they'll be able to be seen pretty quickly. And with the advent of precision munitions, they'll be able to be hit pretty quickly. Uh, so your probability of survival then will depend on, as in the past, when the lethality of the battlefield is increased, units got smaller and they dispersed more widely. Now that's been true for the last four or 500 years and I expect it'll be true in the future. So as the battlefield becomes more lethal because of the ability to see, 
and the ability to hit with precision munitions, then units will become smaller and they will disperse even more widely than they are currently dispersed. They'll have to in order to survive. And I suspect units will have to essentially stay in a constant state of motion uh, because movement provides you the security and the ability to survive. If you stay stationary for any length of period of time, say more than a couple of hours, you're probably going to get killed. So, so I mean, that, that for me really does capture a, a, a change in the character of war. I mean, this image of small dispersed units who are in constant motion and probably technologically in individual motion to make it harder to be seen. But we've been talking almost 15 minutes uh, about the change in the character of war already through demography, through the terrain, through the nature of technology we already have. We haven't even mentioned what most people think these days when they think future of war, they think drones and droids, right? They think artificial intelligence and robots, uh, but you, we've, we, you've already captured a major shift without that. Now I wanna ask you to move ahead and imagine, okay, so what happens then when these small dispersed units are, in, to what degree can they be robots? And to what difference does, does obviously, unmanned vehicles really war, uh, warriors who, are, are, who can be killed without or, or taken out without sacrificing human life, which is a, uh, has always been integral to the, to the character of war? Well, that's right. There's, there's a set of technologies out there that, again, we're seeing previews today. Right. Uh, just as you saw the biplane in World War I, and then you saw fleets of bombers and That's fighters true. in World That's War true. II. So today we see a limited use of robotics. Uh, that's what, what you call drones or unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, those are uh, not autonomous, they're semi-autonomous, they're controlled by a pilot. Uh, you'll see on ground forces, you'll see some limited use of robots in explosive ordnance disposal, and where we'll send a robot out to dismantle the bomb or something like that. And you'll see some other limited use, however, uh, most armies, uh, ours included, are moving out very, very quickly uh, on the rapid development uh, of robotic capabilities. Uh, so the Navy is moving very quickly at surface and subsurface sailorless ships. Uh, the Air Force is moving very quickly at uh, developing a pilotless Air Force. Uh, and maybe it won't be completely pilotless. There'll be a pilot on the ground or maybe it'll be a lead aircraft with the wingmen will be right. pilotless, things like that. So uh, the, the maritime and air domain from an engineering perspective though, it's easier uh, to overcome the engineering problems of flying a robot or sailing a robot. Uh, when you get in the ground, it's a little bit more difficult for the, for the scientists to figure out uh, the robots because you've got the undulating terrain, you've got rocks, you've got dirt, you've got dust, you've got the buildings, you've got, you got all kinds of intervening variables for a robot to negotiate on ground terrain. So the ground for land warfare, the forces that operate on the ground, are lagging behind air and maritime in the development of robotic capabilities. That doesn't mean they won't solve it. They're going to solve it. It's, just, it's a matter of science and time. Uh, and I guess, my guess is 10 years, 10 to 15 years, you'll see the large scale introduction of robotic capabilities in land warfare. Uh, the Russians right now, uh, the head of the Russian military has publicly stated uh, that he wants to have somewhere around 30% of the Russian forces, ground forces, uh, robotic by 2020. I, I don't know if that's scientifically possible, uh, but it, it's a statement of intent. So uh, it's Little clear. Little green that, robots. <laughs> well, it's clear that we're going to have to move in that direction. Uh, for the U.S. Army, we're doing that. So think, for example, uh, we've lost a lot of soldiers in the last 15 years that were driving convoys from point A to point B and were attacked by IEDs uh, and, and, they, uh, and they were delivering food or ammunition or something like that. Uh, think if you could uh, about a logistics convoy delivering the required supplies to a forward unit, but there's no drivers in that convoy. This is already available in the commercial world. The, in California and Texas and other, other states, there are driverless vehicles in the commercial world delivering goods and services to people throughout the state uh, and they're they're doing it on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, a combat environment is fundamentally different than the highways and byways of Texas or California, but uh, it is conceivable and possible. So the introduction of robotic, either autonomous or semi-autonomous land vehicles, uh, I think is a given. I think it's gonna happen. 
So do you think that's going to make war more or less likely? Because, you know, I, I think about, the, again, as war, as war has changed, one of the big changes was that it, when, the, when a monarch could send out peasant soldiers, right, there wasn't a cost in the same way. And then when, as the people's army, and certainly our military today, the, the, the greatest, uh, ch you know, the weightiest decision you face, the commander in chief faces, is you're going to send people into war and people are going to die. If that's less true because you're sending in uh, robotic soldiers, will we be more likely to do it? Or knowing the other side uh, can also do that, you think that's, that's not going to uh, inflict the same kind of damage, so less likely? Well, I, I think this is a very serious moral debate that has to take place here as to. Uh, which one of those propositions is going to hold true. And at the end of the day, war, the nature of war is not going to change, whether it's robots, uh, machine guns, airplanes, or whatever. It's, a, it's about imposing your political will on a human opponent uh, through the use of organized violence. That's what it's about. Uh, and arguably, if one side has uh, a sizable robotic capability and the other side doesn't, then you could easily make the case that the side with the robotic capability is willing to take greater risk in engaging in armed conflict because the cost to that person uh, or that society might be less. Uh, but you also have to figure out the cost of these things. Uh, so these things may be very expensive. They might be, getting, they might be cheap. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of factors that would go into it. Uh, on an ethical basis, though, uh, if you remove death, human death from the equation of war, then the probability is conflict would increase, I would suppose. Uh, but so, I think it's worthy of an in-depth discussion. Yeah. Another book for you. <laughs> <laughs> or for you. Uh, so let me let me now move to Russia because you said you you said the 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 character of war changes, but the nature doesn't. The nature is the imposition of the will of one entity on another, one nation on another, by organized violence. But you know, throughout we had the Cold War, right? And we we had there were hot wars as part of the Cold War. But our state of being with respect to the Soviet Union was described as a Cold War. And there are people today who argue, and we heard some people yesterday at the cybersecurity conference point this out, that with the new Russian doctrine, or the not so new now, but the Russian doctrine of hybrid war destabilization of other countries by information operations and cyber operations, which we are seeing right now, is part of their war doctrine. So my question is, if there is no organized violence, but there is radical destabilization of another country, which is imposing the, Putin's will to, un, to, to essentially attack the West, but doing it through these other means, is that still war? Because there are people who are arguing we are in Cold War II. We had Cold War I, the United States won, Russia was humiliated, we're in Cold War II, Russia's come back. We've seen that movie before. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a tough question. Um, I, I would argue that I wouldn't overly focus on the word organized violence because terrorism may appear to be unorganized. That doesn't mean it's not organized. Uh, or subversion or the use of other means other than large field armies clashing on the, the, the plains of Northern Europe. Uh, there are many ways uh, of war, all of which are organized, but they may not appear to a casual observer as being organized. Uh, but there's certainly intent behind it. Uh, there are plans that are developed and coordinated and synchronized, and by definition, uh, uh, they're organized. Uh, but what you're getting at, though, is where do you draw the line? Where's the cut line? Uh, and that's a difficult question uh, uh, for statesmen, diplomats, uh, uh, civilian leaders, et cetera, to figure out exactly where the quote unquote red line is. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's not easy. And, and uh, I would argue that right now, and it's not just Russia, there are many other countries that uh, engage in that sort of uh, behavior, uh, that they rationally do not want to uh, take on the United States in a head-on conflict, armed, armed conflict. Uh, but they still have national interests that they're trying to achieve, so they want to achieve those national interests. Uh, and those national interests are the opposite, perhaps, of the United States. So they want to try to achieve those national interests through 
means short of open armed conflict, uh, and hence hybrid warfare. Uh, so they're using a lot of techniques, uh, many of which are old. Uh, some of these are not necessarily new. Uh, some of the technologies they're employing might be new, but the ideas are not necessarily new. So the idea of using terrorists, guerrillas, insurgents, information warfare, propaganda to achieve national interests, uh, that's been done throughout the ages. It's just the delivery means today through cyber, iPhones, Twitter, you know, all these technological capabilities that are out there in the information space, those are new. But the idea of doing it is not necessarily new. But if we could, so assume for the next five years, there's no actual violence between us and Russia, but there is active cyber war. And so let's, let's leave out, they're not taking down the grid. It's not a specific thing that leads to death, because that's just an indirect way of bringing about violence. Uh, but it is intensive psych, uh, operations, cyber operations leaking exactly what we're seeing now. Would we say, I mean, as, the, as the, the chief of the army, that we are in a kind of war and we're just fighting back with cyber, cyber weapons? Um, I, I just, I'm reluctant, I'm, I'm careful about the use of the word war. We've had, uh, you know, you have war on drugs, war on terrorism, war on poverty. War gets thrown around very loosely as a term. Uh, but for me, um, I think we should be a little bit more disciplined in the use of what you know, the word war, uh, because it has all kinds of implications. Just this morning on the news, uh, there was a, I forget who it was, but there was some, someone who said uh, that uh, the Russian uh, efforts to, uh, in the U.S. election was an act of war. Well, that's pretty strong language. Uh, and, and if it's an act of war, then, you know, you got to start thinking about your response to that sort of thing. Uh, so I, I would caution people about uh, use of the term war and make sure that we're clear-eyed about what war is and what it isn't. Uh, there are a lot of acts that are aggressive, assertive, subversive, uh, working against your interests uh, that may not rise to the level of war. And it's, and it's not a crystal clear line. Uh, it's something that you have to apply reason to judgment to. Uh, it's not crisp. It's not like crossing the white line on the highway, uh, changing lanes sort of thing. Uh, there are some times where it is, an attack on Pearl Harbor, for an example, uh, the invasion of Poland, but uh, there are other times when it's a little bit more murky, uh, and we have to be careful about it. Thanks. So let me ask you one last question before we uh, turn it over to the audience questions uh, think about different varieties of power. So we've been talking about the power to coerce, and that's hard power. But of course, there's also soft power, the power to attract, uh, and the, the ways, all the ways in which we can solve problems without actually using violence or overt uh, coercion. Uh, so we're ju we've just seen a skinny budget uh, from the president, uh, and that budget, uh, he, and indeed he said, it's a hard power budget. That was part of the uh, rollout of the skinny budget. It's a hard power budget, and so it included a radical cut to the State Department and USAID, which is really the locus of soft power. So I, I wanted to ask you about that as Secretary of Defense General Mattis, uh, or Secretary Mattis now, uh, uh, said, uh, and, and we've heard Secretary Gates used to say this, uh, but Secretary Mattis said, you know, if you, if you cut the State Department, you got to buy me more bullets. And other folks would say, even if you buy the military more bullets, we can't win without soft power. So I did want to ask you to reflect on that. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, in the, in the conduct of international affairs, you have to have both. I mean, you can't, it's not one or the other. It's not a one and zero sort of equation here. Uh, and, and the United States is a global power. Uh, and, and we need definitely need uh, soft and hard power tools uh, in the kit bag. Uh, the, the fundamental basis, though, in international politics, uh, in my view, uh, the system, the international system is anarchic by definition. Is anarchic. Anarchic yep. by definition. And there's no, uh, there's no higher power. There's no higher power to impose order. Uh, so in the United States, the system works because you've got 
various levels of government, federal and state and local governments, and you have police forces and other enforcement agencies that can enforce the rule of law. Uh, internationally, uh, there, it is not that capable internationally to, there's no higher order with a single uh, sole legitimate use of force in the international system, which all states maintain within their sovereign boundaries. Uh, so by definition, the international environment's anarchic. And when it's anarchic, you get into uh, states uh, have to develop hard power in order to survive, uh, number one, and number two, to achieve whatever their national interests are. So the United States has a variety of national interests. It's global in nature. And we uh, need, definitely need, uh, in my view, a significant hard power capability. And, and I would define that as both economic and military. Economics, I would argue, is a form of high, hard power. I agree with that. <clears throat> so, but but uh, out of the State Department or the Treasury. Well, yeah, but, but I, would, I would say that wielding an economic weapon, if you will, uh, is a form That's of hard, hard power. power. That is true. Uh, and then the military piece. And I believe, firmly believe, that history tells us uh, if you, you know, it's peace through strength sort of thing. It's what George Washington said in his uh, farewell. It's what many, many other people have said. It goes all the way back to the Roman times when, when people said, if you want peace, prepare for war sort of thing. So if you are very strong, the probability is that your interests uh, will be protected uh, and that your uh, vital national security interests, protection of the homeland in the United States, for example, uh, are more likely than not to be safe. Uh, if you are weak, yeah, the probability is they won't be. So well, militarily, I think you have to have a, uh, cap uh, a large capability, in my view. Uh, but secondly, you also have to have the soft power skills. Uh, because at the end of the day, if, you're, if you don't have attractive soft power skills uh, and tools, uh, then everyone will lie against you, and then you're standing there by yourself. So that's not a good thing either. At the end of the day, what, I mean, what is power all about? Power is really about getting an opponent or someone else uh, to do what you want them to do that they would not otherwise have done. Uh, so you can do that the easy way or the hard way. Uh, so you do it the easy way through soft power, powers of persuasion, powers of attraction, uh, logic, diplomacy, et cetera. Uh, but at the end of the day, if it's a vital national security interest, uh, and that's what's at stake, then you have to have hard power uh, to enforce your will. If you don't, you're going to lose. But you have to have both. You have to have both. Have There's no have. question in my mind. Great. Thank you. All right, so we are opening the floor to questions. Uh, the light is a little bright here, but uh, I see a question right there. Uh, hello, sir. Wait, just wait for the microphone, and then please introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Cameron Keyes, uh, Army Budget Office. I wanted to oh, thank great. you for being here, sir, because you allowed me to get out of the <laughs> office budget for two hours. Why aren't you working on my budget? <laughs> you should be back in the Pentagon. Headed right back there, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you can get my car on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> the question I have about the changing character of war in urban areas uh, is about the civilians as targets, whereas, you know, historically, it's armies battling armies. And right. I wonder also about uh, climate change and natural disaster as uh, part of the character of war now and responding to those forces. So I'm curious what you have to say about maybe humanitarian uh, aspects, dimensions of conflict, uh, and, and what the Army might be doing in the future to uh, take care of those things. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I believe that most armies, most militaries carry the values of their society uh, into combat. We don't suddenly, we're not a light switch and suddenly turn off the values of America as America's army goes forward. Uh, so America's army has in the past and will continue in the future place high value on the lives of the innocent and non-combatants. Uh, and, and, uh, and we will have to do that. And that's one of the problems in an urban environment. Uh, it's much, much more difficult uh, with non-combatants. So how do you deal with that? Uh, one of the uh, things I think is to uh, is obviously training, but it's also leader development. So one of the uh, deductions, if, if you accept the fact that you're going to fight in urban areas, one deduction will be an increased number of civilians uh, in the area. And therefore, our forces are going to have to be much more highly trained 
in discrimination and discriminate, discriminating fire, the, the application of direct or indirect fire uh, with a high degree of discrimination because we can't go out there and just slaughter people. It, that's not going to work. We can't impose Carthaginian peace uh, on, on an opponent. That's not going to work with American values, so, and nor should it. So high, highly trained forces uh, on the use of discriminatory fire. That then places a huge burden on leader development. Uh, so one of the things, for example, we're going to have to, I think, you'll have smaller organizations uh, in these battlefields, and again, I'm talking beyond, you know, 10 years and beyond, uh, but we're probably going to have to have more mature, more seasoned leaders at lower levels uh, than perhaps the organization design calls for now. Again, I look at the special operations as a model, as a potential model. Uh, they have majors in special operations commanding companies. The regular army has captains. Uh, is there a big difference? There might be. I don't know. We're going to take a look at that. Uh, but the idea of civilians on the battlefield in an urban environment, that will be a fact. There'll be high densities of them. Uh, then from that, you have to deduce uh, that we'll have to have higher degrees of discrimination in our fires, uh, both direct and indirect, and we'll have to have higher degrees uh, of very mature, seasoned uh, leaders, which then brings you to one more factor that I've talked to leaders about. It's the ethical part of war. Uh, so th there are some who would argue that war inherently is unethical, uh, and that's fine. So I'm going to put that to the side. I'm not one of those people. I think there is an ethical use of, of armed conflict. Uh, but what it requires are leaders uh, at the pointy end of the spear that are going to have to have very, very high degrees of, of ethical skill uh, and resolution resilience, ethical resilience, uh, to be able to deal with incredibly intense uh, uh, issues in ground combat, which is fundamentally different than any other form of life. Uh, so fighting inside an urban area, fighting uh, by itself, it's a very intense experience, ground combat. Fighting in an urban area is, you know, 10x levels of intensity and the ethical decisions that are required in very short amounts of time, seconds sometimes, uh, are huge. And we're gonna have to train uh, our soldiers and our junior leaders uh, in, in, in the ability to make correct ethical decisions uh, in a very, very intense and ethically ambiguous environment. So there's a lot of deductions that we have to take from a simple comment like, hey, it's gonna be more urban warfare. That'll be very difficult. That is fascinating. There was a question back in the back over there. Um, yeah, right there. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Steen Rüning. I'm from the University of Southern Denmark and currently American University. Thank you for your comments, General Mimi. Um, my question is, um, if the future is urban warfare and uh, smaller dispersed flexible units, how does that tie in with uh, the units or the army you need to counter uh, spheres of interest politics uh, that uh, is expressed in A2 AD, problems in the uh, ability to overcome the denial of access or ability to, to operate within spheres of interest. Do these two armies, do they overlap? Can you make them compatible? Can you, can you optimize for both scenarios? Or, or uh, how do you see that relationship? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, there are several nations around the world who have developed uh, very complex, very sophisticated anti-area and anti-access uh, area denial sort of capabilities. Obviously, Russia, China, uh, to a lesser extent, Iran, North Korea, uh, they've developed some very sophisticated networks. Uh, I would argue that uh, those, uh, that A to AD structure is highly lethal, uh, and operating inside that structure in large formations will also get you killed. Uh, so uh, smaller, dispersed, very agile, very nimble organizations that are networked into uh, other lethal systems that are either delivered by air or maritime forces will be essential also to rip apart the A2AD networks that are out there. Uh, so I, I do see, a, uh, that we're going to have to do that. Uh, one of the things I'm looking at 
putting together uh, is, is what we're calling a uh, multi-domain uh, multi task force. Uh, we're a relatively small organization, uh, something we're, we're experimenting with it now, something in the range of about 1,500 uh, or so troops, probably led by a colonel, maybe a brigadier uh, down the road. Uh, and it is capable of engaging in what we're calling multi-domain battle. Uh, so that organization will be capable of space, cyber, maritime, air, uh, and ground warfare. Uh, and that these organizations will be highly lethal, uh, very fast, very difficult to, uh, to pin down on a battlefield. Uh, and there'll be very, very high-tech organizations that will be very effective inside an A2AD type network. That's so interesting because it's a different, you know, when we, we've been talking about hybrid warfare, this is a different kind of hybrid in the sense of integrated, right? Where you right. take the, tra right. the different domains and you integrate them in a right. fast, flexible way. And that's key. Way. That's going to be key. That, in the that, that, that's fascinating. I, I'm neglecting this side, so there, there we have, there, uh, there in the back, and then I'll come back to you. Hi, uh, Zach Biggs, a reporter with Jane's. Um, so the supplemental budget request just went over and it includes about 977 million for additional uh, troops uh, for end strength personnel. Uh, if that gets approved, do you know how many more uh, soldiers you'd have and how would you intend to use that extra budget? Is there a particular focus maybe for more future warfare capabilities that you'd wanna put those soldiers towards? Yeah, so this is a highly specialized audience. <laughs> yeah, no, obviously you read the budget. Yeah, <laughs> you can check in with my budget guy. Over here. So, uh, no, it's a great question. I mean, uh, so the, the short answer is yes. We do know how we're going to spend that if we're given that money. That budget has yet to you know get passed. Uh, but our intent, in terms of people and strength, uh, is uh, to take the regular army, the active duty army. Uh, which was on a glide path to go to 450,000 active duty soldiers, turn that around, stop the downward uh, trend, and go to an active duty army of 476,000 uh, by 1 uh, October of this year. We're already recruiting to that. Uh, now, what's the purpose? Where are we going to put those extra people? Uh, essentially, my guidance is fill in the holes. So we have a readiness issue. Uh, you've got a capacity issue. Uh, size of the force. You've got a capability issue, which is uh, the modernized technology and the capabilities of the inherent in the organizational structure. Uh, but you've also got a readiness issue. So the equipment uh, that you have, is it on hand? Is it ready to, uh, is it uh, fully mission capable? Uh, do you have enough people in the organization? Do they meet the right uh, rank and, uh, and, and skill level, et cetera? Uh, the biggest drag on Army readiness right now uh, is personnel. Uh, and we have units out there, many, many units, that uh, have significant holes in their personnel structure, uh, and we need to fill those holes in order to make the current existing legacy Army, the one that you see on a day-to-day -day basis, to make that uh, ready uh, for whatever the President needs it to do or whatever the nation needs it to do. Uh, right now, we have readiness, significant readiness issues. The biggest one is personnel, and essentially, we're going to fill the holes. Uh, we're going to fill the holes in existing units. So we've got time for two more questions. I'm going to take them together, and then uh, let General Milley ask them together. The first is here, and the second is Doug Olivon. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Ayub Erfani. I'm, I'm from Afghanistan. Uh, today, the beginning of New Year in Afghanistan, 1,396. Nowruz, I wish you all the best and a happy Nowruz to all of you. Uh, General McMilly, uh, I uh, can't afford to lose this opportunity to express my gratitude on behalf of Afghan people for your excellent service for Afghanistan, for all your forces in Afghanistan and your sacrifices uh, we keep dear and we highly appreciate that. Uh, uh, my question is in line with your uh, colleague from the budget also. The challenging environment of war uh, in urban areas. As you know, the, your, the brave US Special Forces uh, back in November uh, 2001 uh, fought with uh, His Excellency General Dostum, which I'm advisor for him right now, in a very difficult train and on horseback against Taliban and Al-Qaeda. 
And now, uh, after 15 or 16 years, years of engagement in Afghanistan, we know when Afghanistan is a proxy war, terrorism, terrorist groups, IDs, what is the lesson learned in Afghanistan and how we can deal in mountain areas, not in urban and mountain areas, to fight in the future? Thank you. Great. Hold that. And Doug, you want to ask the last question? It's coming on the... Thanks. General Milley, uh, Doug Olivant, retired Army officer, now at New America. Um, the battlefield you're describing is, is very interesting and high demand. Um, you kind of gave an illusion to maybe having majors command these companies, but is that really the point of failure? Isn't it the, the individual soldier who's the point of failure? Special forces are able to operate in these small teams because the, the youngest person on that team is 24, maybe 25, with a lot of experience. What do you do about these 19-year-old infantrymen or, or women these days um, that may not have the emotional maturity, the training, the judgment, the resilience to operate in this fast, lethal, dispersed manner? So we've got two questions, one ranging from fighting on horseback still uh, and the mountains of Afghanistan to the, to the future. And I have to say, as the mother of an 18-year-old and a 20-year-old, two boys, it's a very uh, salient question. And to mom, we can't wait to get them in the army. <laughs> they would help. Would help them. Be happy to take them on. <laughs> Don't worry about the Prince and Harvey. I have one thing. actor and one musician, so Perfect. you are welcome. We to have lots of bands. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for Afghanistan, uh, uh, Afghanistan is very important. Um, it's a uh, doesn't get a lot of coverage, but. Uh, people need to continually remind themselves, I suppose, that um, the attacks of 911 came out of Afghanistan through other countries, perhaps, but their genesis was in Afghanistan. And our objective from the first day in there on October 7th, 2001, with some Green Berets and some CIA and some others, uh, was to prevent Afghanistan from ever again being a platform from which to strike the homeland of the United States. Uh, and to that extent, at least to date, that's been successful. Uh, and uh, the risk of failure in Afghanistan, uh, it, you know, it, it's, one of, it's one of those areas that there's 20 or 30 or so international radical terrorist groups that are operating on the border between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Highest concentration of different terrorist groups in the world that I'm aware of. Um, and the area is known, the general area, of the, the southern stands and, and, Afghan, and then into Afghanistan is generally known as Korsham. Uh, and in the radical jihadi uh, mythology in their, their own internal narrative, it's the black flags of Korsham uh, that plays high into their, their own internal narrative. So what you don't want to do is hand uh, the radical jihadi groups a victory over a second superpower. Uh, if you want to see radical terrorism on steroids, hand them that victory. Uh, that it would be not good. Uh, so in their mind, in their narrative, uh, the Mujahideen beat the Soviets, so they beat a superpower. In their mind, they're fighting a second superpower. Uh, don't give them a 2-0 record. Don't hand it to them. Uh, so the lesson learned then, in my mind, uh, is, is we have very good counter-terrorist and counter-guerrilla and counter-insurgent capabilities in our conventional forces, in our special forces. We're very capable at it. But the best counter-insurgent is an indigenous force, uh, by far. And when it comes to fighting the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or al Nusra Front or, uh, you know, ISIS, the best fighter is a local fighter. Uh, so the, strat the lesson learned then for us, for the United States or other foreign powers, is the best way to fight an insurgency, in my mind, is by, with, and through indigenous forces that are aligned to your interest. Um, we can introduce large conventional or unconventional forces on a temporary basis to achieve certain specific battlefield effects, uh, and that may make us feel good, and it might even achieve those effects, but it won't necessarily be sustainable. Uh, the only way to sustain success is through some of the soft power follow-on activities, but also through robust, very capable, 
uh, indigenous security forces, police, army, intelligence forces, et cetera. So the lesson you know, from Afghanistan, I think, is you're more successful, your probability of success is much higher, and your ability to sustain that success uh, is through working by, with, and through indigenous forces and sticking with them for lengthy periods of time with assistance, advising, mentoring, coaching, teaching, uh, soft power, uh, bringing in USAID and State Department, so on and so forth. Uh, but I think that's, the, that's my takeaway anyway from, from Afghanistan. Uh, on your question about individual soldier and uh, you know, how we're going to do that, that, that's what we're wrestling with. How do you do that? How do you recruit forces that uh, are capable of operating in this way that I'm describing? Now, we have a little bit of time, so it's not going to be like next week. Uh, but 10 or 15 years from now, how do we recruit? How do we, where do we get the human talent to populate that type of organization to deal with those type of conditions? Uh, that's a challenge. That's not easy. Uh, I don't want to overstate the case, though. I don't want someone to walk out of here today and think that the U.S. Army is transitioning. We're going to take um, special forces and do it at scale. That's not what we're doing. That, that, that is, we're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, you have to have, the United States as a global power has to have a wide variety of tools in its kit bag. Uh, special forces is one of those tools. Conventional forces are another one of those tools. Uh, you know, subs and ships and airplanes and divisions and brigades, they all play a role. Different roles to be sure, but they all play a role. And the power is all of them working together to achieve a synergistic effect on a battlefield. Uh, if you can achieve that integration that Marie just talked about, uh, if, you can, uh, if you can achieve that networked synergy between a variety of type of forces, uh, that's where you get real success. Armies don't go to war. Uh, neither do navies or air forces or marines or special forces. That's pure myth. I hear it all the time. You know, uh, that's not true. Nations go to war. Uh, and the joint force in combination with our allies is what gets success on a battlefield and allows you to achieve and impose your political will on your opponent. Uh, but your specific question about the individual, that's one we're wrestling with. But you need to think a little bit more broadly. I don't want people to walk out of here thinking, oh, the whole army's shifting gears and we're going to do special forces on steroids. That's not what's going to happen. That is not even close to what's going to happen. So as, this has been a fascinating conversation. And I will just say there are two FOW projects at New America. There's Future of War and there's Future of Work. And as you've been talking about, you know, 30% of the military, I know that's on the Russian side, being robotic, and smaller forces and perhaps more seasoned people, think about what that also means for our military and our military as a place where so many Americans uh, can have a career and can start and, and then, of course, become veterans, has a lot of implications for our wider society as well. So, General Milley, I have to say, uh, Princeton's motto is Princeton in the nation's service. Uh, and as an alum, but really equally as a citizen, it makes me enormously proud to have you where you are, to be thinking and leading uh, in such an important uh, and thoughtful way. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Emily. I appreciate it.